Welcome to Stunt Stories. I'm Corey Eubanks. You know, I have a great deal of respect for helicopters, as you well know, in a lot of movies and a lot of TV shows, they use helicopters both on camera and also to film from, using them as a camera ship to chase other helicopters and to chase vehicles in uh, many, many different ways. And they're just, I mean, as beautiful as helicopters are and as handy, handy as they are uh, and lethal in the military, they are just not meant to fly. I mean, it's like someone taking a lawnmower and turned it upside down and said, hey, let's put this thing in the air and see if we could get it to fly around. And <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how they came up with the concept and how they made that happen. And, and my God, I was back in Austria and Dietrich, who owns Red Bull, <laughs> invited myself and Randy Hall and Greg Smurs to go in the Bo 105 helicopter to go sightseeing. And because we went back there, we were working on this on this movie back there in, in Austria and, and thought it'd be cool to go to the Red Bull hangar and check out everything that they have. And I strongly suggest if, if you ever get an opportunity, go do that. Go check out the Red Bull hangar there in Austria, Salzburg, Austria. Unbelievable. It, it's just gorgeous what they have there. And they have the, the Formula One cars and and airplanes and fighter jets and it, just everything. It's just It's just amazing. But when we saw Dietrich in the parking lot, we just went up to say hi. We didn't expect anything from him. Just wanted to shake his hand and tell him how much we appreciate everything he does uh, for the, the stunt community. You know, he puts on the Taurus World Stunt Awards every year. Hardly gets any recognition or marketing value out of it. He does it because he just, in his heart, he loves the stunt community. He loves stunt men and stunt women. And uh, it's his way, I think, of of showing his appreciation for what we do in the entertainment industry. So he had asked us if we had a chance to see much of Austria, and we said no. You know, we've been we've been filming mostly nights. And he said, "Oh, well, how would you guys like to go for a tour of the countryside and in, in in my helicopter?" And we thought, "Wow, yeah, you know, that would be that would be great." Like, what are you thinking? Like next week, or should we call you tomorrow? He's like, "No, right now." And we all kind of looked at each other like, okay, this was unexpected. The next thing I know, we're walking around the back of this hangar and there's the Bo 105, this stunt helicopter, you know, all decked out in the red and blue and silver. And, you know, it's Red Bull. It's got the Red Bull logo on it. And we meet this really nice man, the pilot. And I am so sorry, I forget his name. And I really wish I could give him credit because he was really a nice, nice man. So we climb into this and he takes us off, uh, takes off and we start flying around and he's just taking us for a nice casual, um, scenic tour. And then he started asking us, uh, you know, guys, what are you doing here in Austria? Are you, you know, you're from the States or what are you, are you vacationing? We're like, no, we're stuntmen and we're working on a movie. He's like, oh, and like his whole attitude suddenly changed the whole way he was flying the helicopter suddenly got a little bit more aggressive and like he wanted to show us that, you know, what he could do with this helicopter. And I was sitting in the back and to my right was Randy Hall. And in front of me to my left was Greg Smurs. And in front of me to my right flying the ship was this gentleman. And we're flying and he's buzzing some trees and going up some hillsides really close and you know, like, like he's, we found one, uh, area that kind of had a, like a sheer cliff and he went right at the cliff and then went right up the face of the cliff to the top and kind of stalled a little bit and did this bank turn and came back down and we we're all going, Whoa, that's just, this is cool, man. What kind of aerial stunts can you do? And he goes, well, I'm one of only two pilots in the world who could do a back loop with a helicopter. And I was thinking to myself, wow, that was awfully random just to throw that out there and and kind of kidding around because we all had headphones on and and those those mics that when as soon as you start to talk, it it turns on and, and, and your your voice is transmitted to everyone else. And then when you stop talking, it, it shuts down. And I said, wow, um, it's funny you should mention that because I haven't done a backflip in a helicopter all week. 
And he goes, it's not a back flip, it's a back loop. And I said, well, I haven't done one of those either. <laughs> you know? And he said, would you guys like to? And we all kind of looked at each other like, are you kidding me? Did you just ask us this question? Yes. The answer is yes. I go, wow, that'd be fantastic. And we're like, yeah. So we look down at the ground and we're flying over these jagged rocks, just this beautiful country, but it's just jagged rocks and trees and pretty gnarly looking ground. Well, he flies us out over this beautiful lake, right into the middle of the lake. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, is he not very confident within his own flying skills that maybe he was worried about doing the back loop over the jagged rocks? And we were all kind of quiet. And he didn't say, okay, tighten down your seatbelts or anything like that. He, he just said, okay, here we go. And he hit the cyclic, you know, he gave it throttle and pulls it back and we start climbing up, up, up. And I'm thinking, oh, he's just messing with us. That's all he's doing. He's just trying to scare the stunt guys because he's not going to do a back loop or a back flip, as I still call it, even though it's wrong. It's not, it's not a, a flip, it's a loop. And he starts going straight up. And I'm like, okay, I see blue sky, blue sky. Oh, I see horizon. Oh, I see water, a lake, and now we're level again. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we just did a back loop and it didn't even feel like anything because, you know, it's kind of like if you have a, a bucket halfway full of water and you got the handle of the bucket and you swing it up over your head and in a circular motion, the centrifugal force keeps that water in the, in the, you know, in the bottom of the bucket, it doesn't spill out. So it was kind of like that. And <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, that was great. That was awesome. And then I look over at Randy Hall, who's sitting to my right. And he had this look on his face like he either ate something bad or <laughs> had the stomach flu, little bead of sweat coming down his forehead. He he did not, it, the, the, back, the back loop did not settle well with Randy, apparently. <laughs> and so then the pilot asked us if he wanted, if we wanted to do a corkscrew. And, and we're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And Randy's like, no, no. If you guys want to do that, you, you, and he points at this mountain. He goes, you could land right there and put me on that mountain while you guys go do the back loop. I, don't, I, I do not want to do the back loop. I mean, the, the, the corkscrew. You guys could put me on that mountaintop right there. And I'm like, who invited this guy to ruin all of our fun? Come on, Randy. This is a one in a lifetime opportunity and you're killing it for everybody. So we, we didn't get to um, do the corkscrew. But I then mentioned to the pilot that Greg Smurs was taking helicopter flying lessons. And he's like, oh, well, here, would you like to fly the ship? And Greg's like, no, 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 no. I've only had, you know, a, you know, a couple hundred hours. I'm not really, you know, up. And he goes, no, 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 here, you'll, you'll, do, you'll do fine. Here, take. So Greg Smurs takes control of the helicopter. He grabs the cyclic and starts, and the pedals on his side and, and starts maneuver, and it kind of felt like we were trying to balance on the top of a basketball at first. Like you're kind of, we're dipping forward, we're going to the side, and, I'm, and that's when I think I was most nervous. And then, son of a gun, he gets the feel for it, and he gets control of this helicopter, and flies it smooth as glass, flies it all the way back to the hangar, and lands it. I was, I was so impressed, so impressed. And, and I, the reason I was also uh, so very nervous is, as I, I said at the beginning, I have a great deal of respect and fear for helicopters. Um, I lost one of my dear, dear friends uh, at the age of 23, uh, an incredible uh, second generation stuntman named Reed Rondell, one of the most talented young stuntmen in the industry. Um, his father... Ronnie Rondell and his brother R.A., just incredibly talented stuntmen. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there was there was an incident on a TV series called Airwolf. And uh, Reed was doubling Jan Michael Vincent and riding passenger in a helicopter shooting out behind uh, Magic Mountain in California, out in Santa Clarita. And they had got the shot that they wanted to get, this beautiful sunset shot with the helicopter flying through and I guess my understanding is that the director of photography 
uh, wanted to get one more just for stock footage, just in case, just in case, you know, look at this beautiful sunset. Let's just take advantage of it and send the helicopter back to its number one position. And, and the pilot just kind of banked the, the ship, you know, I don't know what direction, um, to go back to the number one starting position. And apparently the, you know, flying toward the sun into the, into the, the sun and, and it was hard to see. And, and he stuffed it into the side of the hill on Reed's side and, and, and killed Reed. And, um, I shouldn't say he killed Reed. I'm, I, I'm sorry. Let me retract that. Let me be very careful with my words. Unfortunately, Reed was killed. He lost his life, uh, at no one's fault. It, it just, you know, things like that happen in the stunt business. Things like that do take place. Um, and, and it's unfortunate because he was such a wonderful human being. And a great guy. We were supposed to take our fiancés out that that weekend because uh, I had just uh, got engaged. And um, yeah, and that's how I learned when I, I, I called the answering service to try to get a hold of him and um, had learned that he had, he had lost his life. And then there was another friend of mine um, who was my passenger for seven weeks when I was doubling Robert De Niro on a movie called Midnight Run. And... My passenger was a gentleman named Jeff Brewer, another incredibly talented, ta- very talented stuntman, um, up and coming in the business. You know, you, you, you would hear people talk about him all the time because he was one of those guys who was just, you know, multi-talented, skilled in, in, in many, many things and, and was a great guy. When someone's your passenger, he, you know, for seven weeks, you, you talk and you get to know each other. And I'm like, this guy could be like my best friend. And unfortunately... He was down, I believe it was in Mexico, and he was working on a Chuck Norris film and was uh, the helicopter, from my understanding, I could be incorrect, but the story that I heard was that the helicopter blades clipped the side of a cliff and and the ship went down and, and he, he lost his life. Um, you know, and then, of course, there was the horrible accident that took place on tw- the set of Twilight Zone, which was also out in the Santa Clarita Valley Back in 1982, when Vic Morrow and the two children uh, were killed with the helicopter, um, I believe that was a Huey that went down, and um, uh, from an explosion, you know, the the the, the explosion, uh, which is a big fireball, and fire needs oxygen, it needs air to survive, and and it just if you're flying a helicopter over a big explosion, it it really sucks away all of the air, and the blades have nothing to push down against. And it just drops right out of the sky and, and, and killed those three human beings. And a friend of mine, Gary McLarty, uh, who's a, uh, no longer with us, unfortunately, he, he was a crazy wild man. They called him the Wiz, Gary McLarty. Some crazy stories about this man, but what a hell of a stunt man. Old school. I don't know if he even had a stunt bag. He, he never put pads on. He, he could do everything to just, Crazy, crazy Gary McLarty, the whiz. Well, he was riding in the back seat of this helicopter when it went down, and and he survived. Just like my friend Eddie Braun was in a helicopter crash doing a car commercial. I think they were out in Palmdale, and they had a like a Tyler mount on the front of it, and they were countering as a vehicle was racing down the street, and the helicopter was countering it, coming the you know head on toward it, and swoop over the top of the of the picture vehicle, and then kick back up in the sky and make a big sharp one eighty turn and. And I remember uh, Eddie told me all he heard the pilot say was, oh, shit. And then they just went chug, 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 and went right into the ground. And the blades hit first and caused them to cartwheel and just disintegrated this this helicopter. And Eddie said he just found himself still strapped into his seat, but just in some bushes and sand covered with sand uh, was perfectly fine. (laughs) You know, that drove home that night and his... You know, his wife had called him to to bring home some milk. And he's like, yeah, I was, you know, she, she said, how was work today? Well, I, I was in a helicopter accident. It crashed. She's like, oh, well, on your way home, could you pick up some milk? And he's like, it's like just, oh, yeah, I was just in a helicopter accident today. And don't, you know, nothing big. No, they're they're dangerous. They're they're very, very dangerous. Uh, and, and sometimes we use them in the picture business uh, in, in ways that they they weren't really designed for. Uh, and do things that you're really not supposed to do with them. Um, I remember my first time ever climbing into a, it was a long ranger, 
that was the I believe that the type of helicopter it was, and and it was actually on the Dukes of Hazard TV show. There was a sequence, there was a few episodes that incorporated helicopters, but this one, uh, they had the doors off, and I was doubling some actor, some bad guy, and I was supposed to be in the passenger seat. Uh, and the pilot was Chuck Tamburo. And I think Chuck knew this was this young kid's, because I was like 18, 19 years old at the time. I think he knew, oh, this is this young kid's first time in a helicopter, so I'm going to give him a little a little scare. And as he, as he took off the ground, and my first time ever being in a helicopter and it, you know, lifting up off the ground and feeling that sensation, then he banks the helicopter to make a turn. And he clipped this oak tree, clipped the branches along the side, just chop, chop, chop. And I could see the branches, you know, it's like a, a giant weed eater just trimming the tree. And, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, like, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to die. I'm, I just know it. We're going to die. <laughs> there was, there was uh, another time um, I was involved with a, a helicopter stunt that was on a TV show called Crazy Like a Fox. And ironically... This was in the same location. See, see, behind Magic Mountain, there was this place back in the day. It was called Sun Oil. A bunch of oil wells back there. It was called Sun Oil. And it's thousands of acres of roads and rolling hills and a lot of movies and TV shows. We shot Fall Guy back there, the A-Team. You know, we shot some Dukes of Hazard episodes. A lot of, you know, movie of the weeks. So it, it's, it's a place that's been, if you ever saw its credits, you would be you know, blown away by how many movies and TV shows had been shot back there. But again, in the Santa Clarita uh, Valley. And I was doubling this actor and had to run up this hillside as a helicopter was firing missiles at the hillside. So the special effects men had put these mortars separated by about 10, 15 yards apart up the hill. And as I would run toward the mortar, the special effects men, before I got too close that it was going to be dangerous for me, they would ignite it, set it off, and the explosion would go off. And they were going to, you know, just back then, this was back in the mid-80s, and they were just starting to do computer-generated generated images, you know, which we know as CGI. And they were going to have these, the, you know, these missiles firing. They were explaining how they were going to do that in post-production. But the helicopter, as I went up the hill, the helicopter needed to go climb up the hill with me. And it's hovering out um, not very far, 10, 15 feet from me. And as I start to run up this hill, the blades are right over my head. And and because for the, where the camera was, they needed the, the helicopter to be that close to the face of the mountain that I was running up. But if you know anything about helicopters, when they need to move forward to get elevation or move forward, they the blades tip down in the front. And that's how it makes it go forward. So as I was, I ran up to the first explosion, it went off. I, you know, I threw myself down like the concussion of the explosion knocked me to my back. And I got back up and started to run to the second explosion. And as, as I started to run to the second explosion, I could hear the blades right above my head as this helicopter was trying to climb this hillside with me. And I thought, no, th this is, this is not right. Just something instinctively told me to drop to my stomach. And as I did, those blades literally chopped the grass in front of me by about two or three yards and dirt it was like big divots were being chopped out of this mountainside where if I had continued running, I know I would have been decapitated. And when I fell down from that and I started to roll back away from it, because I thought for a second, maybe the helicopter was going to crash into the ground. I rolled down and went underneath the skids of the helicopter. And after that, the, uh, the stunt coordinator, Jerry Summers, had them land the helicopter. And we had a big discussion afterwards. And he was telling them that there are lenses that will make things look closer than what they really are. And that's what we need to do. We need to put on a longer lens to compress the image of the helicopter to make it look like it's much closer to Corey, not have it that close to Corey. That's not safe. So literally this man, um, you know, I think <laughs> helped save my life that day because we had to go back and do that shot. We did it two or three more times. And, but by the time we did it, and the long lens was on the helicopter was was way far away from me. It wasn't it wasn't dangerous. But had I not uh, 
gotten scared and, and my instincts kicked in to just, you know, drop to my belly, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I, it would have chopped my head off or cut my body in half. It's, um, yeah, those are n- nothing to mess around with, helicopter blades. Um, I remember another time I was doubling a lead actor on a TV show called Hollywood Beat. And the actor's name is Jay Ocavone. Really a great guy from New York. Funny actor, good actor, great human being, just fun to be around. He and Jack Scalia were starring in this in this TV series that Aaron Spelling was doing, Hollywood Beat. And there was a there was a scene where myself and this other stunt double named Jerry Spicer, who was doubling Jack Scalia, had to be in this helicopter. We were down in Long Beach. And we had to fly out over this dirt parking lot where the helicopter's chasing these guys in a car and, and the helicopter's trying to cut them off. And I don't know how they're supposed to cut them off. The helicopter's in the air. How's it? I don't know. It's a TV show. But anyway, <laughs> the car comes into the dirt parking lot and over the bay, alongside the bay, and it throws this 180. And then these two gentlemen are going to get out and start to run. The helicopter is going to swoop down and we are going to climb out. I'm climbing out on the right side. Jerry Spicer's climbing out on the left side. And the two stuntmen are going to, uh, Dick Butler and Bob Miner. Now I'm go, are going to run away from us and we're going to lower the, the skids of the helicopter down just above their heads. And I'm going to jump out and tackle Bob Miner. Now Bob Miner's a big man, probably about, 250, 260. And um, I, that's my target. I got to dive down and tackle this big guy. And I'm only 5'9". At the, on that day, I think I maybe weighed 155, 160 at the most. But I, I, you know, I'm thinking, this, this, is, this is what I wanted to do. I want to be a Hollywood stuntman. I'm doing a TV show called Hollywood Beat. And I'm doing a big Hollywood stunt. This is, I mean... I'm in my prime. This is this is what it's all about, you know. And and this is where you gotta, you know, you're gonna get, you know, you you're gonna get sore. You're gonna get, you know, frat paid or whatever you want to call it. We used to say, hey, this is gonna be a fart knocker. This is gonna <laughs> had all kinds of words and terms for stuff when you're gonna ring your bell. So it was one of those just you know go for it type of stunts. And when we took off. And flew down, and as soon as we kind of got into our position, you have to take your seatbelt off and put your foot out on that skid, and and you're realizing we're still 25, 30 feet in the air, and if I you know lose my footing or fall, I'm 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 going to fall right in the ocean because we're not even over the over the, the land yet. And then that that car came in and threw its 180 and kicked up all this dust, and and I'm like, wow, it's going to be hard to see because the helicopter blades coming down over the dirt parking lot, you know, was was making it kind of hard to see, and as we saw the doors open and Bob Miner and Dick Butler start to run and the helicopter swoop down, I'm like, is this as low as he's going to get? <laughs> because Bob Miner's about six foot three and my skids are about three feet above his head. I'm thinking this is like a nine or 10 foot fall and we're running like, you know, 10, 15, they're going 10, 15 miles per hour. How, however fast a grown man who used to be play f- football can run. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I just jumped. And I thought to myself, I'm going to cling to his back and ride him down like a mattress. I'm going to make him my fall pad. And I think Bob had his own his own thought process. He had his own game plan, his own methodology. He's like, no, as soon as I feel Corey start to hit me, I'm going to spin my body, <laughs> which he did, and use him as a mattress and he, as soon as I, I think I just touched his wardrobe, falling out of the sky, nine feet out of the air. I just touched him. He spun, very athletic he was. And and I went flying onto my back and he landed on top of me and we skidded across the dirt and just covered with dust. And I mean, it was, it was not, it did not feel good. I smacked the back of my head. It knocked the wind out of me. And I got up, um okay, you know, feeling, okay, that, that hurt, but I'm good. And very proud of myself. Like, yeah, 
you know, I just did a major stunt, man. And this is, this was gnarly. And my adrenaline was pumping through my veins and this was awesome. And I'm looking over at the camera and the camera guys are all waving the dust out of their faces like they couldn't see. And I'm like, wow, wow, maybe we might have to do this again because there was a lot of dust from the helicopter, you know, the downwash. And sure enough, you know, the stunt coordinator, John Moyle, he comes up and asks us, hey, guys, you know, how do you feel about going again? And I'm like, yeah, that, sure. And the Jerry Spicer guy, he's like, why? Why do we have to go? <laughs> and John's like, there was too much dust. Camera guys had a they had to, you know, turn off the cameras. They couldn't even see what they were shooting. I'm like, holy smokes. So how are we going to make it right? What are we going to do? And well, we're going to bring in a water truck and we're going to water down this whole dirt parking lot. And I'm like, well, that makes sense. And okay, here we go. This is, this is where, you know, it kind of separates the men from the boys in the stunt business. There, there are times where, you know, you, you think, okay, I sold out the first time. I went 100% because I didn't really know what to expect. And now that you know what to expect, it's it's kind of like my analogy. It's like if you go up to a dog that you didn't know that dog bites, and you go to pet that dog, and that dog bites your hand hard. Like, okay, ouch, I didn't know that was coming. Hey, go pet that dog again. Well, if that's your job, you know it's going to hurt. You got to do it again. You know, there's a lot of stunts in the stunt business that are very symbolic to that. It's, you know, crashing motorcycles and a lot of those, you know, I could go on for hours telling you how many stunts are very, you know, you, stair falls, you know, it, there's certain things, car hits, and there's just a lot of, of, of stunts that you know, you're, you're going to get bumps and bruises and maybe a concussion or maybe worse, but that's, that's what you do. That's what you signed up for. And, and that's the occupation that you chose. So I welcome the challenge. I thought to myself, I've been bucked off a lot of bulls, been bucked off a lot of bucking horses. I've hit the ground before, um, you know, just tough up, cowboy up, and let's just go do this again. So I was charged. I was, I well, like I said, I, I, and I'm not pleased. I hope you don't think I'm trying to sound like this super tough guy. I mean, I thought I was back then in the day and I, I wanted to portray myself as that, but I was, um, yeah, I was being challenged with something I knew was going to, was going to hurt again. And we had to do it again. So here we go. And we, and our, but I do remember us having the conversation with the helicopter pilot and saying, Hey, could we be a little bit lower next time? Do you think he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know what height I needed to be. I'll be a little bit lower. So on take two, we come flying out over the ocean and the car comes in. Dick Butler snaps that beautiful 180 right on the mark again. He climbs out, Bob Miner climbs out. They start to run and the helicopter swoops down. I would say an, another three feet lower than what it was. And we're just right over the tops of their heads. And I'm like, this is good. And I dive out and I grab Bob and we fall alongside each other. I, you know, he, he didn't try to spin me. I didn't try to ride him down. We both just kind of like you're tackling someone and you both put your shoulders into the ground and we slid across the mud. And, you know, I'm not going to say it didn't hurt because it did, <laughs> but it was a stunt, you know, it was supposed to smart a little bit. And I remember when, when we, we slid to a stop and I rolled onto my back and I looked up at the helicopter banking, making a very sharp turn to go back out over the ocean. And I'm looking on the passenger side and Jerry Spicer is still in the helicopter. He didn't jump. He was supposed to jump alongside me. When I jumped, he was supposed to jump and he didn't jump. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. No, what the hell? No, we got to do this again. And sure enough, <laughs> they, they land the helicopter to pick me up. And I'm mad now. I, I was, I got a little grouchy. I got to be honest. And I was like, what the hell? Why didn't you jump? Well, I wasn't lined up right. It didn't look like he was lined up or Bob was, uh, you know, running too fast. I forget what his excuse was. All I knew is that we had to do take three. We had to do this again. And I was, I was, um, to say I was a little perturbed would be an understatement. I was, I was pissed off. And, and I think I threatened him. I said, if you don't jump, I'll push you out. But you know what I did? I remember, I remember when we went this time. I'm, I made him commit first. I could, cause originally he was going off of me. He says, yeah, he used to always call me core dog. And I don't know why I hated it. Anybody call hey core dog. 
how did you come up with a stupid nickname like that? I don't like it. But he would call me that. But, I, you know, he's like, yeah, core dog, I was just watching you. And when you go, I'd go. I said, well, this time I'm watching you. When you go, I'll go. And make the, this this story a little bit shorter. It <laughs> it worked out the third take. It worked out. We did it. Um, it was... It was a stunt that I was very proud of of um, doing and and performing, and um, I'm glad I got a chance to share it with you because it was um, <laughs> it was a big moment in my career, and 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 I think little stories like that when you're a young up and coming stuntman, and and you know stuntmen are the biz- biggest gossips in the world. I mean, you do some stunt, and it, if, if especially if you mess up, if you screw up on a stunt. Oh my God, they 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 can't wait to get on the phone and tell their friends, especially today with all the social media and the text messaging and selfies and f- cell phones on set. If you make a mistake, anything, everyone's going to know about it. They can't wait. You do something great, it's like, you know, crickets, nothing. <laughs> it's just very weird, very strange, the stunt community. We all know it. We all, you know, we try to praise one another, but doggone it, when you do something bad, man, everyone, they can't wait just to go and, and just tell everybody all about it. Believe me, I know. I know I speak from experience. I have made so many mistakes. I'll share with you um almost 99% of them and and you'll know, wow, Corey, how how can someone who has screwed up so many times throughout their career have a career for over 40 years? Well, <laughs> hey, sometimes my my mistakes and my screw-ups actually looked very good on camera even though they were mistakes. But uh, speaking of mistakes, speaking of screw ups, there there was there was an incident on on the on the making of the film Fast Five when I was doing the bus sequence. There was a shot um, that we were doing um, with a helicopter, and I'm r- driving the bus, and coming head on toward me is Shauna Duggins driving this little this little sports car. I forget what kind of car it was. One of those fast and furious cars, you know, and here's this extremely talented veteran stunt woman. Um, I consider to be um, one of the best of the best. She's, you know, an incredible human being, wonderful, wonderful lady, stunt coordinator, stunt woman, been there, done it all. And in this sequence that we're shooting, I'm driving this, this bus and I'm going about 40 miles per hour. And she's coming head on toward me at about 40 miles an hour. So if we were to uh, make a mistake and hit head on, I, I'm sure you could do the math on what the impact would be. Um, and in the story that we're telling, um, I have to swerve this bus out of her way. I'm going off to her passenger side. She's supposed to hold her straight line. And at the right moment, at the last moment, when I feel, okay, I, I now have to make this move with this bus. Because again, a bus is not a, it's not a go-kart. It's not a sports car. You know, they don't, they don't have a great deal of, of quick reaction to them. So I would hold it as close as I felt was, was safe. And then I would swerve very abruptly to my left, you know, to pass her on her passenger side. And this helicopter was following her. And the camera was on the front of the ship and it was the shot was to have her in the foreground to stack up the here comes this bus and then the bus you know veers off camera right as she c- continues going straight and the director Spiro Rosados was um was shooting this second unit and you know wanted that shot just right well we had done that shot already four times four times and it it kind of after a while you have to be aware as a stunt performer not to fall into that comfort zone once you've done something 3 or 4 times i believe a lot of people just as human beings we start to fall into a comfort zone of oh i've got this oh i'll just do the same thing i did last time and i think um your adrenaline flow starts to slow down um, your reactions maybe slow down a little bit. You get overly confident. There's you can't. That's one thing I I can't stress enough as as a stunt man or stunt woman as a stunt performer. Man, you got to be on edge on every take like it's your first take. You got to keep that adrenaline going. You got to stay tense, intense, 
be nervous, be re- you know, be be ready for anything. It's when you start getting relaxed and you know, I falling back in the pocket and thinking, oh, I got this. That's when stuff goes wrong. And I was worried that you know, is is that what's going to happen here? So I would try to always get you know pumped up before we do each shot. And on the fifth take, I remember wondering, why are we doing this again? Because it's so the same exact move. It must be a camera thing. They may want it must be wanting to, you know, tighten the lens or do something to do this a fifth time. Cause it is dangerous. There is room for error. I mean, my bus steering could go out. Um, a lot of things, you know, I, I could hang in there just a, a half beat too long and, and clip Shauna's car and things go wrong. And, and sometimes if you, if you get it, on camera, let's just move on to the next shot. Don't keep doing it over and over and over and allow Murphy's Law to settle in and, and make something or allow something that bad to happen. So here we are on take five, and I'm racing toward her at 40 miles an hour, and she's coming toward me, and, and the helicopter is behind her. And all of a sudden, the helicopter swerves over to the side, lowers down onto the deck. I mean, the skids were like two, three feet off the ground on her passenger side. That's the alleyway. That's where I go. That's my escape route. That's where I'm going. And I remember thinking to myself, wait a minute. I I didn't hear that we were doing anything different. And I remember the first AD, Alex Gaynor, That man, I mean, a wonderful, wonderful first AD, first assistant director, very on top of it, shot so many action sequences and and knows exactly what's going on and keeps everybody informed. And I'm thinking, even if my walkie-talkie had gone dead and Alex was giving direction, he would still wait for confirmation back from me that I understood. He would still say, Corey, did you copy that? Do you understand that we've changed the shot? I mean, he's just that you know, attention to detail and communicate, you know, communication is everything. So I'm thinking, no, I didn't get any uh, direction that we're changing the shot. I know Alex would have confirmed with me that I understood we're doing something different. I would have, he would have made sure that I understood the helicopter is not going to be right in my way. Where am I supposed to go? So these things are running through my mind as I'm approaching Shauna Duggan's uh, closing the gap at 80 miles per hour. Again, she's going 40, I'm going 40. And here's this helicopter right in my way. And I remember thinking to myself, what do I do here? What do I do? If I, if I hold my line, I'm going to re- I'm now relying or hoping or praying that, that Shauna is going to suddenly swerve to her left and get out of my way because the helicopters were, were where it is. I mean, I'm relying on or trusting that she's going to or hoping that she's going to do something that she hasn't done for the previous four takes. I'm like, no, something is wrong here. This is not right. And I'm not going to hope and pray that Shauna is going to move out of my way and we're going to hit head on and my bus is going to kill her. No, this helicopter is doing something that I'm not aware of. The helicopter is in the wrong spot. Uh, and, and it's doing the wrong thing. So if anyone's going to get hurt here or killed, it's going to be the guy in the pe- helicopter because no one communicated to me that that, that was going to happen. And I don't know that Shauna knows that I'm going to do anything different except move out of her way. And so that's just what I did. I cranked my steering wheel to the left and went straight at that helicopter and it banked up into the sky and the skid, one of the skids, bam, hit the top of my, my rooftop hit the top of my bus, put a six foot dent, a big crease, a big divot across the rooftop of my bus. And I went down the road and I pulled over on the side of the road and I came to a stop and I got on the walkie talkie and I said, Alex, and he goes, go Corey. I said, the helicopter just hit my bus. I go, either he goes home or I go home. I was referring to the, to the pilot. I was mad. I, I, I sometimes have a temper and I was mad. I was furious that, you know, th- that guy flying that helicopter had put not only Shauna's life in risk, put my life at risk and, and something that, that never should have happened. That's not how you make movies 
uh, with helicopters. You communicate. Everyone knows exactly what the move of the helicopter is going to be. And if the helicopter is going to do something different from the previous four takes, that's discussed so that everybody on set understands we're doing something different. You just don't take the liberty to go, oh, this is this will be a cool shot. I'll just move over here and drop on the deck and get right in the way of the bus and and they'll figure it out. So as I was standing there on the side of the road and they came rushing down and, and picked in these vehicles that, you know, cause we were way down the road and cause I, you know, I said he had hit the bus and they didn't know what I meant and everybody showed up. Well, the ground to air communicate communicator, who was also the pilot's wife, she comes around the front of the bus kind of with this little half giggle. And she goes, Oh no, Corey, what you experienced was the downwash from the blades. That's what you think sounded like the skids. And I, I said, stop. I put up, you know, when you make a timeout, signal with your hands. I, I went like that. And I said, here, time out. I said, whoa, stop talking. Stop. I said, I've lost two friends in helicopter accidents. I go, this is not my first rodeo. I've filmed with helicopters before. We did four takes. I know what the sound and the feel of the downwash of the helicopter going over. And I go, and it wasn't that. I go, and if you'll stand back here with me, and I moved her back away from the bus, I go, and look up there. You see that big divot? that six foot dent in the rooftop of the bus that wasn't there before. And just then the pilot comes walking around the front of the bus, kind of giggling. Wow, that was close. And I go, Oh, you think it's funny. I mean, I was, I was so livid. I was so angry. I knew I had to step away or I, or I was going to, I was going to throw a left hook and drop this guy on the asphalt. I was that mad. I was that, I was that pissed off because you just don't, you just don't do that. You know, and like I said, I've lost two good friends and, and helicopters are not, not to mess around with. And I'm sorry, I'm heated. I got to go hit the punching bag or something. Now I'm all riled up from telling you the story. Doggone it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed listening to my stunt stories. And if you do enjoy listening to me get heated up, that you'll, you'll come back and listen to some more, some more stunt stories. Enjoy your day.